Uh, he's going to okay. workshop like through how you might take a land that is not making a lot of money to one that's bringing in more income, but doing it in a nature uh, positive way. So uh, Timo, I'll uh, uh, base in capital and uh, full disclosure, I do. Uh, I did purchase a little bit of his, his SAFs on a little bit of a flyer there. Um, he's been in the space for a while and it, it's, he's got some interesting ideas on it, on using a traditional sort of real estate approach of, you know, increasing cash flows and then flipping the property to, uh, you know, doing that with a, na a nature lens. So uh, take it away, Timo. Great, thanks, Matt, for organizing it. Uh, sorry, I missed my slot. For some reason, I was thinking Earth Day was, you know, Saturday here in the US and starting on uh, Asia time. I thought tomorrow we were starting Friday. So I'm, uh, it's, it's a little late here in Colorado, so I'm a little, a little tired here um, and didn't quite get the presentation fully done, but I think we can go through it. Um, the title of the workshop is property development in quote. And uh, Matt, can you see the screen? Can you see my slide? Yes, I can. I So it's got like nine circles and property development yeah. on the left okay. side. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, I can't, I can't see my screen here. So, um, and we're taking the approach of valuing natural capital and ecosystem services. So a different approach. I think uh, Pradeet and uh, Rich's points were uh, really, really good and really well taken uh, there about uh, you know holistic valuation and carbon is just a, a part, you know, a slice of the stack. And you know, Matt, your points about emission reduction and policy. There's like so many things we need to to throw at this, but. Um, a little background on myself just to kind of set the stage. Um, my nickname's Timo uh, Thomas Morgan. I've been in commercial investment real estate for over 20 years. I've done a billion and a half of volume um, as a developer, broker, appraiser, investor. And I've actually worked on, on basically all types of properties, um, mobile home parks, apartment buildings, industrial. Uh, most of my career has been in the single tenant net lease space. So like drugstores, fast food, Dollar General, really these passive income um, properties working under a section of the tax code here in the US, the 1031 exchange. The normal traditional real estate asset types. And what we're, we're doing is creating a new asset type. So real estate investors, agnostic or indifferent. They don't care about nature or climate or carbon per se. They might say they do, but really the, what they care about is yield. They care about cap rate. They care about cash on cash return. They care about risk reduction and, and protecting their, their capital. But we're, we're creating basically real estate investments that could be in these, these colors here. So uh, ecosystems, forests, agriculture, rainforest, grasslands, adaptive reuse of, of old buildings. There's actually um, several... I think the number is in the trillions almost, but um, of functionally obsolete buildings around the world in terms of like old shopping centers, theaters, schools, buildings that just like aren't being used and basically should be torn down. So there's a huge opportunity in adaptive reuse. Uh, but we're looking at it from an ecosystem services and a natural capital perspective. And before we go on, um, I, I like to, you know, I, I have a few little jokes. I, I love memes. This is one of my favorite memes. I'll give everyone a minute to look at it there. And people uh, feel free to drop um, you know, comments there in the, in the chat. And I'll see if I can answer them um, here. If you can't see the screen or you can't hear me or you have a question or whatnot. But you know, as a society, wash hands, commit to net zero, right? And then we thought COVID-19 was this big thing. And oh my God, there's a recession coming and climate change. And I, I want carbon in the climate change box. Whereas if you if you go a step further and you look at half of the world's GDP dependent on nature and ecosystem services and the biodiversity crisis, Hank Paulson of the Treasury, uh, former Treasury Secretary here in the East and um, Nature Conservancy did a report a few years ago. Bloomberg just echoed that report around the biodiversity crisis. We need almost a trillion dollars a year to finance nature to stave off a mass extinction event in our lifetimes. So let's just put that in context, a trillion dollars a year to stave off a, a mass extinction crisis 
in our lifetimes. And that's nature, biodiversity, ecosystem services. It's not not carbon. So to me, I put carbon in the in the blue or excuse me, the green uh, box and, and rich and the other carbon people on the call. Sorry if I offend you with that. Uh, so a little context. And it looks like it looks at nature, basically the biosphere, and it shows that all society and all is based on nature and natural capital. So I'm going to use these words interchangeably. But this is a great I call this the donut diagram. You know, it's a, you know, you got life on land, life on water, uh, clean water and sanitation, and climate action. So we could put some carbon, uh, nature-based solutions and whatnot down there, and then everything else is here. The economy, society, if that's in shambles because of nature loss, biodiversity, frankly, it doesn't matter how many, much carbon we remove technologically. So real quick, just keep this in the back of your mind. Um, and Matt, this kind of goes to your question about what we're going to focus on, restoration or conservation. Everyone just kind of go through your mind. Maybe it's somewhere you just visited, you went on vacation, uh, maybe you drive by it, you jog by it, you, you know, run by it, what, you know, or whatever you, you know, a, a property in your town or city that so uh, you'll see in a second on the left so run down dilapidated contaminated i call that restoration or the sec the, the last bullet point there pristine beautiful nature but threatened so that's conservation so on on the left we're talking about restoration of land and on the right we're talking about conservation and so maybe at the end if we have time people could kind of use we can use a, someone's example they can drop it in the chat maybe we can look at it maybe we can talk about it uh whatnot so just kind of Start thinking about like, oh, I drive by that vacant building every day. Oh, that that property was contaminated. In the U.S., it's a, a brownfield or a Superfund site. It's an abandoned factory. Um, you know, it's a vacant retail uh, store. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, where I kind of look at everything is th this graph. It's it's not really a uh, <laughs> left to right graph. It's more supposed to be a center graph. But uh, Left is, on the red is restoration, basically, and on the right, green, conservation. And everything in the middle would be like. Did anyone else lose Thomas's sound? Yeah. Hey, hey, Timo, uh, your sounds have gone in and out a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, so basically on, on the left, restoration, and on the right, conservation, everything else in the middle, apartment buildings, industrial, whatnot. And there's a whole discussion that we're not going to get into around embodied carbon and operational carbon around buildings. There's a huge opportunity in that space. I'd love to talk to people about it. Fifth Wall, the big uh, prop tech firm, is working on the decarbonization of buildings. But that all goes here in the, in the middle. And then we're, we're focused on restoration on the left and conservation on the right. And just to um, kind of set the stage here, we're gonna, we're gonna look at a normal property, like normal commercial investment property. And let's just say it's on 10 acres, has a building and retail center, it could be a apartment building, whatever, all these different property types. And the, something we need to keep in mind for what we're doing and, and doing real estate investing around nature-based solutions is cost, price, and value. So cost here, look at the difference in these numbers. Cost is land value plus the building. That's what it costs to actually buy the land and build the building, a million five. Price, let's say that building is vacant. There's no tenant, there's no income. It might be a million dollars. And we call that below replacement cost. So it might cost you a million five to build it and buy it, but if you sold it vacant with no income, it's only worth a million. Whereas value, and that's where we get into the, the value of nature, the value of ecosystem services, what we call in commercial real estate investment value. Like what's it worth to you as an investor, right? If, like what are the attributes that, is it pride of ownership? Is it income? Is it capital preservation? Like what's that value? Is it IRR? Is it um, tax avoidance? You know, what, whatever, deferral. There's a lot of different values, but look at the difference in the value. This, this could basically be the same building. So 10 acres, 10,000 square feet, million five, vacant, worth a million. 
rented, leased with income, depending on, there's a bunch of stuff that goes into that. And that's what I've spent 20 years doing is why that building or why that property is worth two and a half million leased with income versus these other two values. So I, I want to just pause there. If, does anyone have any questions and that you want to drop them in the chat or I want to make sure everyone, I'm not going too fast. So, or just give me a thumbs up to keep going. Look, looks like you're good so far. Okay, Matt, Matt said my daughter laughed at the meme. I, I have more memes uh, I could share with you. So that's some good ones. Some nature-based solutions and technological carbon removal memes too. Um, so you know, back in the context setting of that meme, right? Of like the nature crisis, biodiversity crisis is embedded in all that is the value of nature. And the field of environmental economics and the field of ecological economics are coming together. And it's, it's, it's a nascent field, right? It's 20, 30, maybe 40 years old, depending on how you look at it. But they're starting to value nature. And th this is from a, a report, the, like the OECD, a few years ago. And you look at just, if you can see these values, seagrass nutrient cycling, estimated annual value, $1.9 trillion a year. Pollination, you know, half a billion or $500 billion. You know, fisheries, coral reef tourism, $36 billion. So these, these numbers, you start looking at them, you're like, whoa, like recreational fishing in Germany. It brings 6.4 billion euro to the economy each year habitat. And, I'll, and we'll go through like some of these like ecosystem services in a minute, but you start looking at these values and you're like, whoa, those are huge. So let's just put that in context of this hypothetical trillion dollar carbon market that's going to emerge sometime between now in 2030, 2037, 2050, you know, depending on who you talk to. You know, if it's Shell Oil, they're predicting a $4 trillion uh, carbon market in 2050. So let's just use the math. The Robert Costanza, kind of the godfather of ecological economics. He, you know, he originally did the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and he's, they've updated him and DeGroote have, and team have upgraded, you know, updated the value of nature. Their most recent value was in 2011 annually. $21 with inflation. So the annual value of Global ecosystem services is 177 trillion. A one trillion dollar carbon market is, is a fraction of that, of, of value of, of to society. And so we could get into a discussion about what's the value of carbon removal. And I'm not discounting carbon removal if, if Rich is still here and some of the carbon people are here, because the, the value of carbon removal could actually be argued if you go back to the donut slide, it's the value of nature plus society plus the economy. If we do carbon removal right, because it's protecting nature, it's protecting people, it's protecting uh, the business in the financial sector. So, like, it's not, I'm not ripping on the carbon market here. I'm just putting it in perspective of the value of nature today, 120, 77 trillion a year versus a hypothetical carbon market of 1 trillion. We're, we're, we're talking about fractions. So, and to, to kind of back this data up, this is from FEMA right here. And I shared this with Matt a few weeks ago. These are some of the numbers we're working off at, at Basin. But FEMA has valued these ecosystem services, air quality, climate regulation, which includes carbon removal, erosion control, flood and storm. If you, if you, I don't know if you can see it or not, but pollination, water filtration, whatnot. This is the value of per acre per year of economic value. And they, they base this on hundreds of studies. We have another database we're using that actually for example, green open space, wetlands, river, and forest. And so if you're looking at this and you're saying, wow, look at the value per acre per year of these erosion control, $15,000 alone per acre per year. Uh, and if you add up these like blue numbers for green open space, like if you went through and you, you stacked these ecosystem services, these actually add up to around 15,500 a year. If you add in habitat, pollination, recreation, tourism. And these are all based on like appraisal and valuation techniques. It's all documented. It's all science-based. Uh, it's all, it, it, we've got tons of literature on it. 
we start to look at these ecosystem service values and it goes back to the value of a vacant piece of land with no income versus a piece of land or a piece of real estate with income. So that's kind of where we're, we're headed here. So to expand on that, like that, this, you know, this, this thing on the left, uh, the, the WIST, there's actually, depending on who you ask, anywhere between 10 and 50 types of ecosystem services or even more. The basin stack is our, our honed in science-based stacking of all the different ecosystem services. You got food, energy, raw material. I'm not gonna read them all, but air quality, pollination, risk reduction, water security, water quality, recreation, tourism. And they're even starting to be able to vet, put value on cultural and spiritual value, uh, ornamental resources, aesthetic value, like what's you know, existence value, what's the value of the monetary value of, of just because something exists. So these can start to be quantified either lump sum, what's the, what's the number it's worth in the trillions of dollars to society or per year. So uh, spatial or, um, or to temporal or per acre spatial. So per acre per year. So th this is how we're basing all of our, our math on. And here's just an example of like four pilot projects we're working on. Um, urban open space, this is an old asphalt uh, parking lot, a former big box store from a, a big retailer we're working with. This is a farm here in Colorado. It is an active farm. So we, you have some normal income, like grazing income. And this is just this urban open space is just a little tiny lot behind a building that's just sitting there. Like, what's the value of that if it's kept as open space or if someone were to pave it? And if, if this guy were to expand his parking lot or if he were to put a building, like what's the value to society as those three things? open space, a parking lot, or a building. So that's what you start to look at in terms of, of value. Like what, what do we value in society and in our investing? And these properties, these four properties in this example, total about $9.4 million vacant, as is, just like that, a little bit of income on that farm. Otherwise, the other uh, three properties have, have no income. Running our numbers you know, from the basin stack here, and using the FEMA and our other database, 4,000 studies, the, the annual, and so annual baseline ecosystem return, if, if we could convert that to cash, that's the kicker. That, that's like where we're working on our business model right now is how do you convert that $2.5 million to cash per year? And and who wouldn't take that? And even if if it was just land, but you know you you knew if you're a corporation or a government or a universal asset owner, a bank, an insurance company, sovereign wealth fund, family office, and you have capital at risk in the economy, in buildings, in roads, and in, in whatever banks, what houses, whatever, like would that be a good investment for you? Matt, I heard you there. Did I lose you? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I went off mute because you broke up for a bit and I, I should have put it back on mute. I'm sorry. Um, what I was going to say is um, if we can kind of, because we have to do get to the next uh, speakers fairly soon here, but like what should people be looking for if they want to get into this, you know, on their own? Like what sort of properties, you know, like what are the like sort of the, most obvious things for them to try to look for? How would they go about maybe educating themselves? Um, how, uh, you know, like, how would they do the, some of this analysis themselves? I mean, I think, you know, obviously sharing the deck would help. Um, I'm not trying to create a bunch of competition for you, but I think you'll agree that this <laughs> is a wide open space with uh, room for a lot of players to succeed if we can figure out a way to monetize the ecosystem services that are being provided by these properties. Yeah, so you know, it goes back to this question of um, in your town or city, just just having open eyes, and you can you can do it from behind your computer and looking for certain attributes of like what you know what a property needs to be. Uh, connectivity is a big one for for habitat and biodiversity. It, is it connected to other protected areas or could it be connected to other protected areas? 
Um, how far on the, on this scale is it on the left or the right? You know, contaminated versus pristine. You know, threatened. Um, I, you know, it's, we're, we are open sourcing all this. Um, it's it's actually licensed under Creative Commons um, attribution, uh, non-commercial. So if you're a nonprofit, you can use our methodology and whatnot for your own nonprofit. It goes back to the question that Rich and Pradeet were, were talking about around like um, indigenous peoples and uh, native landowners and whatnot. And, and the, this divide, like global North, global South, like if you're a nonprofit and you're just doing it for climate impact, you can use everything we're building here basically for free, or uh, we might have just a, a, a percentage of the credits that go to our foundation. Um, but if you wanna use it for profit, we actually, this whole model is built actually to create a profit. So uh, you can use it inside uh, the basin protocol, which puts all these pieces together. And so the best thing to do, Matt, would be just to have people reach out with properties and we can kind of see where it fits and whatnot. Okay, and so you can actually help them uh, do that. That's, yeah, that that's the, you, the you point can, like, is- Create a partnership basically, or, or some sort of arrangement. Yeah the, yeah, the point is, is to scale this uh, thousands and thousands of properties and we, we can't do it all ourselves. And so, yes, there'll be a lot of competition, but in, in the case of climate and nature, <laughs> more ecosystem services and thriving ecosystems in, na in nature is better for all of us. So that, that's the oh, position. That's awesome, Thomas. All right, hey, is Samuel Lee here? Yes, yes, no, I'm I see here. a Sam. You are. Okay, are you are you ready to go? Sure. All right. So I'm going to